One of the first things I like to do is to show an animation. And I think this is really helpful for patients understanding this procedure. Okay. So the first image here shows the blood leaking backwards. So when the heart squeezes, all the blood should go forward out the aortic valve. And then the mitral valve is here to stop the blood from going backwards. And in your case, you have a lot of leakage here. Sometimes this can be 50, up, upwards of 50% of the blood is going the wrong direction every time the heart tries to pump. So over time, that puts a lot of extra stress on the heart because it really will have to squeeze all that extra volume just to get the blood going forward. We can see this color when we do our ultrasounds, our echoes. And the color, it's called Doppler ultrasound, right? So we shouldn't see any color. And, and in a case like yours, very similar, where we see a bunch of this blood flow that's going the wrong direction. So if these leaflets here are not coming together, if they're too far apart, then you'll have an area where there's leakage through. So the goal of this procedure is to get those leaflets touching again, so that the blood will then not go backwards and all of it will flow forward in the right direction. So this is the uh, device, this is the clip, it's at the very end of it. And that's what we're going to use to bring those leaflets together. It has a lot of knobs, it definitely takes a while to get used to this device, but it's actually been a really brilliant device for certain patients to treat their regurgitation. When we start the procedure, first of all, we're going to use a vein out by the hip called the femoral vein. People use the word groin, I don't like it. So you can see here's the hip, here's the vein. And we're gonna access that with a, a small tube, it's called a sheath, but that really gives us access and we can use that as a freeway to get back up to the heart. And from there, we can pass a wire up and we cross through this thin part here called the septum. And then we bring in the delivery sheath here and that sits right above the mitral valve. And then the device will come out like this all these knobs give us a lot of ability to move in the right direction. During the procedure, I'll have one of my partners, Dr. Kim, who does a transesophageal echo. And basically, it's an ultrasound that goes down your esophagus where the food goes, okay? And because it's right, the esophagus is right next to the heart and it sits right behind the atrium here, we get beautiful images. So it's not quite like an animation, but we see 3D images like this that are, that are pretty amazing and can really guide us through the procedure. So then what we will do is just kind of maneuver the, the device. We get it lined up so that it's perpendicular to the valve. We can do that on 3D imaging. And then we can go underneath the valve. And this just shows how we will grasp the two leaflets together. So these top elements come down and then we close the clip and we will get rid of the part in the middle that was leaking. Mm -hmm. Blood flows right in around the device. And we can check this out on echo. And once we're totally happy, then we'll leave the device like that. It becomes part of the heart. And this is showing that leaky blood before is now stopped from going backwards. Because we've restored the co-optation here, we've got the leaflets touching again. You say it stays there forever, thing like that? Yeah, no, once the device is in, it becomes part of the heart and then it'll stay forever. First of all, how do you decide on a candidate for this one? And we use a heart team approach. Some patients are gonna be better off with surgery and then some patients will be better off for the clip. Um, it gets a little complex, so, you know, we usually will know what we're doing and we'll be on the same page, but, but we'll often need to talk it over with a surgeon. We have a multidisciplinary conference where we all get together the interventional cardiologists and the surgeons, and we figure out you know, what the best treatment option is for that particular patient. How do I prepare for this? Yeah, so that's a good question. So there is a bit of a workup, okay? You know, first of all, we'll want to do a transesophageal echo before your procedure. A transesophageal echo, also known as a TEE, is a procedure where we use an ultrasound, right? And it's about this size, and it goes down your throat where the food goes. It turns out that that's right behind the heart. They actually basically touches the heart. So we, from there, we can see exactly what's going on with the valve. That's the procedure we do at the hospital, but it's outpatient, which means you'll come in, one of the imagers will get some pictures, and then we have cardiac anesthesia or, or an anesthesiologist there to make you comfortable. So you will be comfortable during the procedure, but we won't totally knock you out, just kind of deep sedation. We do the procedure and then you can go home about an hour later. 
And that gives us all the information that we need, you know, to make a good decision on what the best uh, treatment pathway will be. We also want to do a coronary angiogram, okay, which is again an outpatient procedure, but we do them at the hospital. And we go in through the wrist artery here. We go back up to the heart, shoot some dye out, and make sure there's no major blockages in the arteries that are on the outside of the heart. How far in advance of the surgery do you, do you need to do those that you just mentioned? Yeah. I mean, any time before, but usually what will happen is after I see you, uh, we'll get those on the schedule. If you've had a recent angiogram, then we would probably use that. But if you haven't had an angiogram in a long time, we'll want to check an angiogram and get the transesophageal echo done. So once that information um, is obtained, then we'll get you a visit typically with a surgeon. Um, not every patient has to be, see a surgeon, but you know, in order to get that heart team evaluation, we, we would typically want you to see one of our surgeons as well. And then we'll put our, our heads together at the uh, conference and come up with a treatment plan, and then we get you scheduled for a date. How about recovery, which is so, the most important? Yeah. So the nice thing about this device is the recovery is really, you know, it's, it's pretty quick. Uh, we use a small incision here, and uh, most patients will stay one night. And then, you know, you walk in, you'll get the procedure done. Uh, it can take us anywhere from an hour and a half or two to do the actual procedure. Afterwards, uh, we put a stitch in the vein where we went in, and then you should be able to sit up in a couple hours. And then most patients will just go home the next day. Patients don't really need pain meds. I've never had to give anybody pain meds. And then you'll walk out. We just tell patients to take it e kind of easy. You know, we're no heavy lifting or something because we were, you know, you know, around the area of the access site. And then most patients will start to feel better um, over the next couple weeks, but it can take up to a couple months before patients really get back to their full strength. So sometimes we'll see them a week or two later and ah, I'm not really feeling too different, but patients will go through cardiac rehab afterwards and you know, usually on the three month follow up, you know, patients have really gotten back some of their strength and energy levels. Am I a candidate or who's? Yeah, so for the mitra clip, you know, there's two big classes of, of patients that have problem with, you know, with mitral leakage, okay? Um, and the one problem, there's a group of people where the heart just doesn't squeeze very well. And over time it becomes dilated. Mm -hmm. So the leaflets are actually fine, but because the heart starts to dilate, they're just not touching anymore. So those patients are really best for MitraClip. On the other side of the spectrum, there's a normal functioning heart, okay? And, and the leaflet, there's a problem with the leaflet. So instead of coming together like this, there might be a flail. So over years, all of a sudden something happened in the, the that leaflet has a flail that kind of goes up, okay? And in those cases, typically surgery is going to be better because they can do a lot of things when they're in there. They can put on new cords, they can resect it. But if a patient's older and has a lot of comorbidities and they're just not a good surgical candidate, then we'll talk it over with our surgical colleagues and they may recommend that we just do a mitra clip and uh, we get you know good results with them. But I think in a really young person, guidelines everyone would think you know that would, would agree that the surgical mitral repair uh, is superior. Is there an age limit where this is not recommended in terms of an older person? Like No, there's really not. There's really not. I mean, the oldest patients I've done are 101 and I think if the quality of life is good, you know, if the patient, you know, age is not necessarily a, a thing. The symptoms can be kind of subtle because it's such a gradual, you know, change that some patients, you know, they used to go walk a couple blocks and then they just stopped doing that. If I ask patient point blank, they say, how are you feeling? Do you have shortness of breath? They'd say no. Mm -hmm. But when you look deeper, they say, well, you know, how has it been over the last year? And especially if a family member is present, they'll be like, well, they're really huffing and puffing, you know, they can barely make it out to the car or they used to, you know, walk a mile every day and now they're not able to do that just because of too much fatigue. Yeah. But when you really look back over a time period, you can see a change in, you know, what a patient's able to do. Interesting. How long have you been doing this procedure? So I've been doing this procedure since uh, my fellowship down at Scripps, which was about 10 years ago. Uh, we were part of the, some of the original trials um, with this device. Uh, have been doing it basically since that time. Uh, we're the highest volume program in all of Orange County, and we do a, a high volume. With that, I think we get really good experience. With that experience and the high volume, we get better outcomes and uh, kind of makes our program unique.